Hi, my name is Monica Kretschmer, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Universal Women's Network, Woman of Inspiration, and this is the Woman of Inspiration podcast, where we speak with women who are leading, inspiring, and motivating. These are women who are paving the path, the road less traveled, ignoring the naysayers, and inspiring others to dream big. Today is a very special guest on our Woman of Inspiration podcast. It is Lindsay Harl Cadets. Lindsay, you are the 2019 Woman of Inspiration Influencer Award recipient. You were also the founder and CEO, well, I want to say founder and CEO of um, your company, your brand strategist and mental health advocate, and of the right Harl. Now, Lindsay, I've been working with you for over the past couple years, and I've got to say, uh, this is our first podcast. This is our very first time that we've actually, you know, actually pressed record and all of those conversations. And I'm super excited. Like I was looking forward to this moment because you are such a ray of sunshine. You have such knowledge to share. And of course, you're, you've become such a strong voice in the mental health advocacy um, area that I've just watched this like freight train roll over this past um, few years. So I'm um, super excited to have you today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here now. And yeah. So Lindsay, where we're going to start with, I think, as you know, every woman has a story. You're also one of our 100 Women of Inspiration book contributors. You have so much to share. You know, I always say well, every woman has a story. So Lindsay, your story starts, and we were talking about this in the green room at age three. And I, we started having this conversation. And, you know, when we think about where that story starts, you know, people's reflection goes back to maybe like 12 or, you know, those years when they can remember it. But your story started when you were three. So maybe you can jump in and start there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not really until the past, I guess, seven months, seven, eight months that I realized that my story started when I was three, but I suppose that's the case for everyone. It actually starts when we're born, but meh. Um, details, details, tiny details, but specifically uh, with my story, because for those who don't know me, uh, I am a mental health advocate. I am a brand strategist, strategist, as Monica said, but uh, one thing that I am most proud of that I don't really go out of my way to say is, um, you know, I am also uh, a purging, uh, purger in recovery. So I'm just celebrating my 10 years of, no, of, of stepping forward out of my eating disorder. Um, my dog's going crazy right now. And he's applauding for you right now. He's saying, yes. congratulations, mama. Yes, he's saying, thank you, mama. But it, but specifically why I mentioned the purging is because it, in order to understand why people purge, why we have these uh, eating disorders or disordered eating or certain feelings around food, you know, it actually never really comes down to what the food is. Very rarely, it, it's about what is happening inside and the food is one way to control that and control the trauma. And for me, food was really just a way to dim my light, a way to numb anything because I knew I wasn't living aligned with myself. I didn't really like myself for many for many voices that were in my head that weren't mine and as I started to reflect and go back over well what is my timeline of life you know where why was I purging well that has to do with a lot of things that were said harmful whatever but then it goes back even further is why did I allow those things to be said to me in the first place and I was able to track things right back until to, to when I was age three. I mean, I have an elephant's memory in the first place, much to my parents' chagrin. Um, but it's, you know, I could track these very interesting moments where when I shone, I was told to dim 
when I stood out and I was then, you know, reprimanded for that. And so anything that was different or weird or, you know, me was wrong. So that's how it, 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 it's not necessarily a, oh, my story began at three because of some trauma, because of some hardship. I did not have hardship in the sense of I grew up in St. Albert, Alberta in upper middle class. My parents are still married to this day, 50 some years later. Um, you know, we were well off. I have a sister with a good relationship. And so I come from a very good background. You know, so it wasn't this horrid upbringing that I was brought up in that created trauma. It was a life, the life outside of the home. It was having to put any quirk away because it was different. Mm -hmm. And even at the age of three, I so desperately wanted to fit in rather than belong, because I didn't know there was a difference, but we as humans were wired to belong as we, as we are. Whereas, particularly when we're young, we quote unquote belong because we are fitting in and we're not really able to go and explore who we are in order to fit in. So this is weird, anyways. Anyways, yeah, that's where my story begins. <laughs> So what I find so interesting is, you know, the dimming of your light. And I know this is such a really big topic. I know you have you and I have had conversations about this before, Lindsay, about how important it is to own your worth, um, to stand in your true um, self, to be heard, to be valued, and, you know, not to let anybody dim your light. And it's hard for women. It's darn hard for mm -hmm. women to own their worth. And so I'm going to go back to 2019, Woman of Inspiration Award recipient. You were a nominee. You were nominated. Um, so maybe just share, because I think your, your transformation from accepting even that role in response, that role of, of that you know, nomination was really transformative too. And I'd love for you to share that with the listeners because it's a beautiful story. Yeah, I mean, so to, to plain and simple, I thought the nomination email that came through to me was a joke at first, right? I was like, oh, sure, sure, nominated. Yeah, okay. And then I realized because of who nominated me, I was like, no, this is real. This is, this is, this isn't a joke that I was nominated for this award. Okay. All right. And then I sat back and thought, well, do I even put my name forward? And I had asked a few um, colleagues of mine who had previously been nominated. And they said, yeah, you got to meet great people, you know, just do it for that alone. Um, and I was like, all right, well, okay. I, I'm, I'm going to try this. One person believed in me um, I know she doesn't take that lightly, so I'll move forward with this and see what comes of it. You know, flash forward a few months after that, you beautifully called me. Well, actually, you sent me an email and it just said, Lindsay, um, I have some information uh, regarding your nomination. Can I give you a call? What's your phone number? And I immediately thought, oh my God. Yeah, so... So then uh, flash forward a few months forward and I get the notification um, that I am a finalist and I'm invited to come and spend a day with other, other uh, finalist nominees in the mountain. And I didn't, I mean, I, I said yes, obviously right away, but I didn't know how I was going to do that. Go and spend a day in the mountains with these accomplished women. Are you kidding me? Like, oh my goodness, I was, what? So I ended up having to journal so much just to get to that day and go and meet these other women. Fortunately, I did that. But then even after that, I was still very intimidated because it's like, I just didn't see why I was there. Um in relation to the total comparison. And then there was still a couple more weeks before the awards in person 
uh, the, the last awards in person before COVID. Um, and uh, I, I still wasn't sure how in the world, like, okay, if I win an award, how do I get up on that stage? What do I do? And so every night I had to journal, I am worth, I am worthy. I am worthy of this award because uh, of this award because I'm worthy of this award award because. And so because of that, um, when I heard my name, I was still shocked, but I was able to get up there and then speak and so on and so forth. But it wasn't really until the after that I, because of the award that I received specifically, and it was the, you know, the Woman of Inspiration Influence Award. And I, I, what, are you kidding me? Is what went through my head because when you think influencer, you think someone who has all these people following them on social media, these people who that's how they make their living is they are influencers, they are content creators, they big numbers is basically the first thing that always goes into my head. And for me, I was just, well, no, my numbers are tiny. They, what, you know, my, my shares are low, my likes are low, but. Okay, and it wasn't really until I understood what influence was and it's influence is just are you influencing those small people around not small people are you influencing around you. That's the only thing that true influence is, is am I showing up for those people who are who matter in my life, am I showing up in a way that's honest to who I am and and. Does that then inspire someone to maybe do a little something differently in their life? And it was when I started to understand what that word meant, I was way more comfortable stepping into the role of a of, of woman of inspiration, of a woman of inspiration influencer, award winner, a uh, recipient. And then um, from there, it just opened these doors to connect with other women, particularly within UWN. And I, I can't really even fully explain what being, because you invited me to be a national ambassador and I did, thank freaking goodness. Um, and what I've learned is just how to start standing in your voice and stepping into your voice and not being shy about having a voice and an opinion um, as you are. And since then, and I don't know, maybe it's because it comes with age, who knows? Maybe it's because when, um, when you have to stand up and advocate for someone else, it's easier to then start to bang your drum a little louder. Um, but that's, what UWN has taught me and being around these great women. And it, I, I still wake up and think, how can I show up and be around these women who do these amazing things, who are, who I'm not sure actually sleep, who, you know, are also, but, you know, and I'm also thinking of one particular who also exercises, eats healthy, runs to business like does all these things and is also a mom and and i so i still very much have this imposter syndrome but i still show up because it makes me better and so now i feel at the very least worthy of having the title of woman of inspiration influence or award because i know i'm trying every i'm trying every day i'm trying better every day i'm trying to be someone who is who can be seen as that, as opposed to the, the, the timid, shy gal who tried to dim her light pre-nomination. Mm. I just have to say, thank you for sharing, because I think that is one barrier that all women at some point on their journey face. It's like stepping into the spotlight is a really uncomfortable thing because um, it's a lot of times it's associated with ego, um, imposter syndrome. And I think I've asked this question on all our calls. It's like, who's ever had imposter syndrome? And there's not one call with not one hand that has not gone up 
Mm -hmm. It's something that we all experience at some point in time. But I think the exercise is, is that when we can use our own voice, it empowers others to use their voice. And I think what you've articulated in your experience is how important that is. And, you know, especially as I love how you articulate influence, because mm -hmm. you influence and the power to influence others. It's not about having a million followers or likes, because if sometimes it's really empty. Um, but it's about the power to really impact people and create change and a ripple effect in a positive way. So that you definitely earn. Um, you know, I, I was looking at, you know, three words to describe you. Um, you know, we'd ask that for the book, but what are the three words that people would describe you as? Yeah. Do you um, remember what they were? Do I you remind you. You might need to remind me. I know uh, quirky is on there. <laughs> <laughs> creative um I forget the last one heart ah right and I just think you know like how beautiful is that that you're standing in your own power where you know your own strength that that guides you and it guides who the people that you know event up and end up working with you following you and and supporting and championing you so um, yeah, I just really think there is so much wiseness to your words and the authenticity that you bring to the table. I think that's partly what makes it easier to, to, to speak now is I used to be afraid of, well, goodness gracious me, I used to be afraid of the quirky and, and for years, that's exactly, that's what I was trying to numb that's what I was trying to hide and get out. And even, and it was not until 2020 that I realized, Lindsay, you're not gonna get away from the quirky. In fact, you know, again, when you look back over my life and I realize when people liked me most or enjoyed me most or I had the most impact was when I was that quirky person it was never when I was that corporate professional um you know it was when I had a quirky moment or a quirky insight or something and so I had to lean into that when I realized oh number one I should probably start doing some marketing on my own since I do that for my clients and it might be good to have my own newsletter um and I was just like, well, what do I call it? What do people know me as? Well, I'm quirky. I'm quirky Lindsay to Moat Lake with so many people. Well, let's just call it quirky quills then, right? And so I started to lean into that more. And I think the more I leaned into that, which is actually me, it became easier to talk about those things that I'm so passionate to talk about and to do so in my way with that, you know, light humor to bring that light on these darker heavier topics of depression of suicide of you know purging of other things of, 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 of other things of anxiety of not listening of listening of so much and I wouldn't have been able to do that I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't realize that my quirk was my strength and so it's time oh, to just lean into gosh. it that is pure gold your quirk is your strength that is like a quotable your quirk is your strength and that why does everybody have to be different you know like the perspective that people bring to the table is what really is what you know makes it so unique right is that shared perspective i mean it's a beautiful thing i love that you know, I, I, I'd love to see that, how you're empowering other women to do the same, Lindsay. It's really been so empowering to see that journey. And I see that depression, constipation um, behind you. So I'd really love for you to share about that piece of your mental health and wellness advocacy, mm -hmm. how that sort of works into, you know, um, your voice as well to inspire others. Yeah, so depression, constipation, how pooping saved my sanity, and other stories is a book I wrote in 2016. 
Um, and it is all about drawing comparisons between being depressed and being constipated with a little tongue in cheek bathroom humor. And I would say that it, it, that is the my that was my first foray into sharing mental health. But uh, to be totally honest, I wrote it um, to help my well now husband, my then partner, better understand what depression was, because it's not just being sad. That is the smallest sliver of it. So what is it then? And so because I'm immature and have poor humor at times, um, I was able I was able to draw the parallels between constipation and being depressed. And it all stemmed from a joke that a friend and I had basically by the book itself starts with, I had the best poop of my life the other day. And I talk about how after you've had that struggle, because almost every single human being in this world knows the struggle of having to get a poop out, you just sit back and you're just relaxed and you're like, yeah, I did that. This is, life is gonna be good. I can do this, I got this. And in my head, I was just like, this is the feeling that we should just try and capture and somehow, sell it to people and nobody will be depressed anymore. And I sent that to my friend who was going through, um, who was working through depression at the time as well, just to make her laugh because I knew it would. But then I was like, but there's actually something to this because when you think about it, you know, depression, well, first off constipation, you're clogged. Depression, it essentially clogged your brain. So there's this cotton head that you can't think straight. Things take so long to get through. Well, when you're constipated, things get clogged. Things take so long to get through. And you know, what might once take 30 seconds takes five hours. Who knows, right? So it's, and then there's things such as like, you know, when you're, when you're constipated, you have a distended belly when you are depressed, you sometimes have this distension of reality. So what exactly? And so I was able to bring these parallels and making it a little bit funny while explaining here's what this is. Um, and here's some funniness to something into life, because for me, my humor saved me mm. when I let that in back in 2011, when I first started getting help. But it's, it's the humor that, that, that I don't want to say is missing from depression, but I know that when someone is depressed, they almost feel as though they have to stay depressed every day in order for them to be taken seriously as having this where, but that's not true is because you can have moments of happiness, of joy, of laughter, because you're still a whole person. You're a full person in your depression. And you still experience that vast array of emotions. And what's important is to not numb whatever emotion is coming up. And so if you're feeling that humor, lean into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did back in 2011. And that's what really helped save me was to use my humor. And so all of a sudden, it's, if my humor helped save me, why can't my quirk help me to show up even more? Mm. And so, you know, the humor in it is, I think, what's so refreshing that anybody can relate to, um, anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, the timing right now, I think is so important. I mean, we've just come out of COVID and, you know, we all know that it's been hard on everybody's mental health and well-being, mm -hmm. you know, locked down, not seeing friends and family, losing loved ones, losing businesses, um, having to reinvent, transform, you know, on the drop of a hat. And so, you know, I think your timing on being able to now help people manage through that and, and remove the stigma of it is super important. And so do you notice like there was, was there a real big shift 
for when you started talking about this, Lindsay, to maybe even up to as you know, recent as last year? Have you seen it being more open to talk about um, mental health and well-being? I, I mean, yeah, yeah yes. Um, that's it. I find um, I've always worked with clients who supported mental health. So it wasn't really a shift in conversation there. I think it's more, um, it's, there's more companies looking for support in the mental health of their leaders and their teams. Uh, they're more open to those conversations now because how can you not be when you see the impact that it's having? Um, I think it's, for me, it's not this big change because I, well, I mean, I've always just kind of blah about it. Well, here's how it is. Take me or leave me. I mean, it doesn't make me less than. Um, but I, it, it, it is changing slowly though, because I'm not sure we need to stop being so scared to talk about mental health because people think mental health is mental illness. And the thing is mental health is just health. It is your health. If you are not, if, if this is not okay, like with well sleep, if it's not fed properly, if it, if it doesn't have enough water, even you cannot make those other choices for your body, physical, emotional, otherwise right to be able to be healthy so even if you're exercising all the time but this is in real right you're it's not a balance so mental health is just health what where the stigma is is on the mental illness mm. and, and it's stupid and it's frustrating but <laughs> sorry like and it's so frustrating monica but it is, I mean, but the thing is, and the reality is, is that searching on depression, searching for anxiety that has gone through the roof since March, 2020. Yeah. Um, so prior to that though, prior to March, 2020, it was already going up. So what I think the pandemic has done is merely just sped up how fast people were searching for it. It's just pushed it along as fa faster because it needs to, it needed to be addressed hmm. period. And so maybe that's the, the universe or whatever saying, Hey world, the minds of your beings aren't right. And so I'm going to show you faster, hmm. you know, and that's, and so I think that, that that's really it is that people are more aware now because they've also had to stay at home quiet mm. and sit with those thoughts and slow down. And that has allowed time for us all to go inward and look inward and now be uncomfortable maybe with what we were afraid to see before. So the phrase I'm fine, mm -hmm. we all know that's code word. I'm not fine. Yeah. I just don't want to talk about it. So how do you get people to actually talk about it? And let's, let's be specific here. I mean, we have women who have been, you know, just economically, I mean, this past year has been the hardest for women, mm -hmm. um, you know, working from home, homeschooling, um, now having to take, you know, like there's been so many things that have put more pressure on women and, you know, everything that they were doing before now is come to like, you know, double the amount and made it that much difficult. And the word I'm fine, when you know, it's not really fine. How do you get more women to be really open and honest about talking about what's not fine? Because we have leaders and leadership roles. You're supposed to be strong all the time. How can you be talking about how you're maybe not so fine when you're in a leadership role? How do we start that conversation, Lindsay? How do we make it comfortable for people to be okay sharing when they're not fine without fear of, you know, their leadership role being completely questioned? Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that's a great question. How can we? And I think it just comes down to really taking the time to listen with open ears, without judgment, because that's also the thing is, you know, women, it's not that we don't want to share and open up and just, I can take on the world. It's that at least in the conversations and the research I've done, a lot of it comes down to, because when we've asked for help before, it's been shut down. When we've said where we're not okay, we've been judged. So it's not necessarily a matter of wanting, of not wanting to say something other than I'm fine. It's a matter of when we have in the past, oh, so what? Oh, well, well, that's not cool. Oh my, right? And these tones of judgment and it's, well, and I, so very specifically for me, I'm fine, like that I can tie right to 21, um, age 21, when a friend of mine from four, for, of four years, and he sat down beside me and asked me, hey, Lindsay, how's it going? And I wasn't fine. And I turned to him because he was a friend of mine of four years and just out of nowhere, I was just like, do you really want to know? And he said, no, right? Like the, the poor fella, he looked so fearful. Oh my God, no, she's going to spill it all on me. But then he, he didn't say it like that. But then he proceeded to tell me that it, sharing that you're not okay makes people uncomfortable. And so from then on, I became fine. Mm. but I learned how that because of that incident is that that was the, one of the first times that I went to share that I wasn't okay. And so it's not necessarily on us wanting to speak. It's on us, the rest of the nation, taking the time to listen mm. and not judging when something comes out, when, when, when someone shares that they're human and how do we do that more in these corporate roles well i mean it's we continue to promote diverse like we promote women we promote women in diverse roles we also create these more psychologically safe environments yeah. um that encourages you know real teamwork real connection of the mind and the people like and building these real social connections mm. and and it's missing a lot of it's still missing mm. um partially due to covid mm. because that's taken that huge physical bar uh and that's added a huge physical barrier because and 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 i will say this though it's crucial that leaders check in with their employees but also that employees check in with their leaders um, because, uh, because who is checking in on, on our leaders? So if our leaders show that they care for us, then we show that we care for our leaders and a simple, we understand, we know when personalities change, we know when there's stress, you can feel it in the air, you can see it in somebody's shoulders and you know, it, I, I'm not a mom, but I know when my mom friends unload on me, they feel better. And I'm not judging anything of like, I have no motherhood to judge, right? Be, but they just feel so much better. And then they can continue on. Mm. And so it's how are we listening with compassion so that it doesn't, so that we don't make what somebody says about who they are as a character, as a person in that moment. So interesting, Lindsay, is, you know, what I really love is the fact that number one, I think it's really important for leaders um, to be, to feel safe enough to share when they're not fine, right? And to be open and authentic because that enables, you're right, you know, when that person in your network, you know, when they're not their jovial self, their, you know, they, it's just different and you can sense that energy, right? You spend a lot of time with these people. 
Um, but I love the fact that you are empowering or your suggestion is to empower the employees to really empower the leaders and to also provide that safe space. There's so much conversation that needs to happen around this. Um, you know, and I think that is what COVID has opened the opportunity to do that mm -hmm. it's leaders responsibility to take care of their people. But I love how the people can take care of the leader. I know we had a, um, a call um, with our group um, where the leader was had to step back and how their employees came to support them. And she was blown away. But that was a sign of her leadership coming full circle, that circle mm -hmm. of reciprocity. So there's so much great work to be done. I love what you're doing to engage people in those conversations and having the courage to share your own experience to help others work through theirs. Well, and, and, and I've been saying this a lot lately in the past month, probably because I don't know, it just hit me one day, but it's, you know, our stories are totally unique to us. They are ours, but they're not our stories alone. Mm. And that's one of the, that's what I find so fascinating is, you know, recently I had a conversation with a, with a new friend, but with a gal across the pond over in the UK and our stories were so, they're unique to ours, you know, and there's changes here and there, but we, are uh, they're so aligned in you know our own stories with mental health in our husband's journey with their own mental health and us having to support and what that is and so it, it i think that's the biggest reason why we need to share our stories and i know i know that my sharing my story encouraged at least one of my friends because she told me to go and get the support she needed mm. And that's worth it. Yeah. When Very. the people we love can go and be brave then. If we're mm. brave, they can be brave. So let me ask you, um, as we sort of, you know, we've got, so I've got so many questions to ask you. I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, your business, about your leadership and some of the things that you're most proud of, you know, in, in your evolution of your business and, you know, building your own brand, you know, so what are you most proud of, you know, as you have, you know, built and sort of, as you continue to grow, what are you most proud of, Lindsay? Oh, that's, that. I don't like to say I'm proud of many things. So shine it, but Sunshine. yeah, but I will say, I mean, I'm coming into October 1st will be my 10 years in business. And I mean, that's pretty cool as a soul, pro, soul props, 10 years in business, not having to go knock on wood to another job. But from that, I'm actually most proud of the fact that um, it's given me the opportunity to discover my own passion and what that is, which is values and values work and supporting, you know, whether it be brand, bringing their own voice, their values and putting that into action and how that can actually transform an entire gosh darn company. Yeah. You know, while I started as a copywriter, I'm actually a brander and I help you see the gaps in your business because you have no clue what to say. And then with the quirky Lindsay Harrell stuff, like and the neural change practitioner um, that I am becoming and the work I'm gonna be doing and am doing with quirky entrepreneurs and how they can show up in their own voice and really understand how do you take these values and then turn them into mindset and then the behavior to have action that matters. And I think I'm pretty proud of that. I think, you know, I grew up thinking what a clear path would be for me, knowing it would never be the path for me. And so to be able as this shy gal back in my late twenties to just jump out and start, that's something to be proud of and to still be here. Cool. Super exciting. Congratulations. I, I, I love, and I, this is always, I've never seen a straight road ever, not 
all of the women that I've ever interviewed, it's always been like more of a zigzag Mm -hmm. and detours and bumps and hurdles. And, you know, I think that's what's so beautiful is that all of your experiences have brought you to this place right now. And also something interesting is that how you have created the opportunity for yourself. It wasn't mm-hmm. actually kind of just had your name on it. You actually had to build it yourself. So that's something pretty darn um, important and something worth celebrating. So congratulations. Thank y'all. I'm also pretty proud of my my dogs. I'm a proud dog mom. I will say that. So, yeah. Well, you do have a pretty uh, cute dog. I see the Instagram posts um, on your running days. So, um, yes, he is a um very cute pooches um cute two of them yeah yeah pooches. two of them yes yeah. of course <laughs> so Lindsay um you know as we talk about female leadership what what sort of things inspire you um of things from other female leaders what inspires you most about other female leaders resilience and the and you know just even thinking of the national ambassadors how they know their voice and step into it that that is so in scotch darn inspiring to me is is women who show up who show up with their voice who are there who are able to ask questions are open to to change it's inspiring Mm -hmm. and and to uh, and to to just Monica I am forever in awe of you because you just have these huge gosh darn visions and you say this is what we're doing and it happens and I know it doesn't it's just like done it happens but I know, you know, the blood, sweat and tears and, and that, that to me is inspiring because it's being able to see these big visions and break them backwards and just, how can I do that? How can I, in my own way, in my area, Mm -hmm. right? Like, and every single one of those ambassadors, every single one of the uh, women and the supporters, the men in my life who I look up to, they do that exact same. They have this authentic way of standing in who they are saying, this is what I want. And then being able to get it. And it's not without sacrifice. And I really appreciate Mm -hmm. you saying that. I mean, big visions come with big responsibilities, come with a lot of hard work that not too many people get to see of the blood, sweat and tears, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever happens without putting in time. And, um, you know, and so I think that that is really super inspiring. I, I'm, I feel so proud to be surrounded by, you know, women that are embracing that as well. It, it just, that's why it works so well is because you understand the sacrifices and you see, and you want to be celebrating the successes with each and every one of the women that are um, going through on their own journeys, right. Mm -hmm. As we work together. So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, super excited to see, you know, where 2021 goes. Of course, we have the book coming out in the fall. We have the road show, which is yes, that big, audacious hairy vision traveling across Canada um you know to really raise the bar for women to be seen heard and valued such a you're such a great advocate for that Lindsay um you know before we wrap up here I want to ask you what your this is the woman of inspiration podcast I'd love to ask what your definition of a woman of inspiration is yeah there's so many great ones out there, but for me, it's a woman of inspiration is just really someone who is doing their own thing. They're going to their own beat. Um, and they just don't know that other people are watching. So they just keep going forward on their path because that's what they are inspired to do for whatever reason. And eyes upon them doesn't matter because that's not what they're looking for. They're just eyes forward. That to me inspires me. And mm. I see it, you know, I see it in my mom and my sister and my grandmothers, rest in peace to you, wonderful women and to all the UWNers. I don't know if I've never said that. My friend, like, it's, 
I'm very fortunate because it's not hard to wake up and think, who shall I be inspired by today? It's pretty easy um, with the uh, with the circles in my life to be inspired. So amazing. And for those that are listening, because that's always something that who are women of inspiration? There are each and every one of us that do not know the ripple effect that are just working so hard on achieving their goals. Um, they're the everyday person right beside us, in front of us, speaking to us. So thank you for, you know, just articulating that because I think it's really important that um, everybody plays a role. Um, everybody is inspiring and nobody really knows how they inspire someone unless they say, Hey, you inspire me. So there's lots of secret admirers out there, <laughs> I think in our networks, which is yep. super cool. Um, and why do you think I, I just, again, why is it so darn important to celebrate the achievements of women, Lindsay, you, you seem to articulate this. So, so great. Be well, <laughs> now I have to be articulate. Oh my golly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, who else is because I mean you've you hit on it earlier is we dim our own shine and there's something so transformational when someone sees you when you don't know that you've been seen and someone really sees you and wants to shout it from the rooftops it makes you want to step into that a little bit more mm. And realize, yeah, I I did do that. That's pretty cool. I mean, I see it every day with my clients when I, because I dig in to get what's really cool about them. And all of a sudden you see these light bulbs go on and they're like, oh, that is pretty cool. I am really unique. Well, it's the exact same reason why we need to keep pushing women uh, and championing women. It's because... <sighs> we're freaking amazing. I'm sorry. Like <laughs> women are amazing. Why should we not be promoted? Why should we uh, on merit? Right? Yeah. But why should we not be promoted? Why do we have to go through so many gosh darn loops, loops, loops and hoops and that aren't there for, for men. Mm. And that's like, we're human. Mm. So raise the bar for women. We've got lots of mountains to move. Um, women, I do believe, as you believe, are going to drive change for 2021 and through the rest of the decade. So exciting to see um, where this all goes. I'm super proud to have you part of our network um, and part of the 100 Women of Inspiration book. Um, you really do um, inspire women and, you know, stepping into some uncomfortable conversations um, and really does inspire others to do the same. But I know that you have some really cool um, routines that you do. Um, and I would love for you to share that with our listeners today, because I think it's really important as we go through and our days are really busy. What is one of your non-negotiables that you go to, to really, that you say helps you succeed? Uh, gratitude journal, hands down. I. I, I did a, a power journal. I did a gratitude journal from 2013 to 2017. And I was like, oh, I'm good. I got this down pat. And I stopped because I had thought, oh, I'm, it was becoming a checklist of gratitude and everything. Okay. And then 2017, 2018, they were hard years and I could feel Lindsay Zener, my whole self was going to a lower le energy level, a lower level of being, I was becoming more surface level. And so I, I, I didn't like that. January 1st, 2019, I was like, okay, well, I got to change this. I'm going to start my gratitude journal again. And I did. And every night, I gratitude the crap out of my life. And I changed it because it was no longer a checklist. It was gratitude. And why am I grateful for this? So everything, there's a why to what am I grateful for, as opposed to now it's just a checklist of gratitude. Mm. Um, and that it, it took, you know, it, yeah, it took until November, 2019. So even past the, the uh, awards um, for it to really change my brain. Mm. And so I could continue to show up in gratitude and 
purpose and I didn't have to actively do it. I mean, I still do it every night throughout all of 2020. I did it throughout 2021. I still do it. And even on those horrific evenings when, when I don't need to go into those stories, but even on horrific evenings when not so good things have happened, mm -hmm. I have still gone to my gratitude journal in the evening. And that has been one of the most powerful things because it changes the neurons in your brain. And that is the mm -hmm. most interesting thing is we can change our brain. Mm -hmm but it's not easy and it's a long haul. And that is one of the reasons why I think so many people give up so, so easily on these really good, positive things that they have incorporated into their lives, didn't really see any impact. And then they stop and it's, well, January 1st, 2019, November, 2019, that's a huge time for me to actually notice Right. And so we can do it. Hmm. And that, that hands down one of the best things. And I still do it to this day. I don't plan on giving it up. And that then allowed me to add all these other beautiful things to my mental health. Very cool. <clears throat> well, I have to say that sometimes I get to the gratitude part and I maybe have a line, <laughs> which is fine. Right. And, and, and I don't say this, I don't say this to be like, you can't just put the, what you're grateful for. You have to put the what is it as as long as you're gratitudeing <laughs> that's not a word like one line is fine because it's still something right and even if you and for those who maybe want to start gratitude journey, just write something like just do the what who cares about the why when you start to feel that it's getting into checklist most that's when you up it but if you're doing one that's fine because you know what sucky stuff sucky days they still really suck. And it can be hard to find that thing to be grateful for. Mm. And so the fact that you're even finding one is beautiful. I just find that it's hard enough for me to write something before I nod off to sleep because yes. my eyes are tired and my I'm done. So gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Um, so so inspiring uh, speaking to you, Lindsay. Thank you for all your words of wisdom and for being so authentic, um, you know, um, and being so, so much your quirky self because it really is a pleasure to talk to you. It's entertaining, it's like hearted and it's, um, you know, I look forward to the road ahead. So um, if listeners are trying to get hold of you, how can they do that, Lindsay? Well, they can find me either on Instagram or Facebook at Quirky Lindsay Harl. I am on LinkedIn at Lindsay Harl Cadets. <laughs> and I also have the websites uh, www.quirkylindsayharl.com if you're looking um, as a creative entrepreneur who needs a little support with that mindset behavior work. Or if you're looking for more brand work, you can visit me over at therightharl.com. That's T H E W R I T E H A R L E dot com. Fantastic. And I'm just going to say if people are reaching out to you on LinkedIn, I know sometimes the inbox on LinkedIn gets very full. Flag heard your woman of inspiration podcast that will make sure that Lindsay will check it, accept it and, and know exactly where um, this was coming from. But Lindsay, thank you again um, for all of those that are watching and all of those that are the millions that are listening. Um, you know, I hope that you enjoyed this Woman of Inspiration podcast and this really authentic opportunity to speak to Lindsay Harl Cadets. Um, once again, pleasure, 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 my lady. I look forward to the road show and to having you part of the Woman of Inspiration book. There's so many conversations to have. And of course, if you did enjoy this podcast, we really do encourage you to share it with your network. There's going to be some woman, some person that's going to really be um, the information that they need um, for today to push past those boundaries and um, inspire them into action. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Lindsay, for um, being a part of our Woman of Inspiration podcast. Thank you for having me.